Good afternoon, dear colleagues. My name is David Gonzalez. I'm very, very honored to speak on this first international online congress of bone augmentation. I want to thank Dr. Cherry Fuchu for this kind invitation. And I also want to thank all of you for being virtually here. Uh, the topic of my presentation will be three-dimensional bone regeneration, the using the oh sorry. Sorry. Um, you have to click on your presentation. I think you you have to open your presentation or click on the All right. Now you see my, my yes, screen. Yes, it's again. Everything okay. 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 So as I was telling you, my topic will be three-dimensional bone regeneration using the split bone block pull technique on the aesthetic zone, what everybody usually calls the Curry's technique. So. Or it has some problem. Arif, do you see me? You are okay. All right. Now you see the yes, screen. The second slide we can see also. Okay. I will start again. I'm sorry. No problem. Everything is okay. 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 So for those who are entering now to the presentation, my name is David Gonzalez. Good afternoon to everyone. Um, I'm very honored to speak on the first international online Congress of Bone Augmentation. I want to thank Dr. Cherry Fuchu for this kind invitation. And I also want to thank all of you for being here, virtually at least. The topic of my presentation will be three-dimensional bone regeneration on the aesthetic zone using the SBB technique, split bone block technique, also known as the Curry's technique. I'm a periodontologist. I study the three years periodontology program at the University Complutense of Madrid. And I also obtained my PhD degree on the University Complutense of Madrid. I studied under the supervision of Professor Antonio Vascones and Professor Mariano Sanz, who are my mentors. They were and they still are my mentors. I'm very grateful to them. And I have my private practice on Murcia. Murcia is in the Mediterranean coast on, in the south of Spain. I have a clinic. My clinic name is Clinica Ortopedio. And this curious name is because my wife She's an orthodontist, and I do periodontics and implants. And I also have in my clinic an education center where dentists from around Europe come to my clinic to train with me. So as I said before, the topic of my presentation will be the rich augmentation in combined vertical horizontal bone defects, the so-called 3D bone regeneration exclusively on the aesthetic zone. My goal will be to produce um, enough bone so I can place the implant at three-dimensional optimal position with healthy bone and healthy soft tissues. I want to start by saying that there are factors that make three-dimensional bone regeneration more difficult. These factors are that when we do three-dimensional bone regeneration, we have smaller number of pathogenic cells, less blood supply. We have difficult primary closure and a higher risk of dehiscence and 100% autogenous bone. We need 100% autogenous bone in all, when we want to do the Curry's technique on the aesthetic zone. I want to say that I also use um, GBR using PTFE membrane with titanium reinforcement, but on this presentation, I will speak exclusively 
about cases treated with the Curry's technique, the split bone block technique. I will present, um, I, I want to say that in 2009, I started using this technique. I went to Wolfsburg to train with Professor Curry. I went to the courses and there in 2009, I met Dr. Sherry Fushuk, who was a resident in there. And when I came back to, to my place, uh, I did the smaller courses of weekend. I started to do this technique. Before starting with this technique, I usually did um, cortical medullar bone block for 10 years. And I usually um, did GBR using PTFE membranes and autogenous bone. So, what I want to say is that when I started to do, to do this technique, I already had some bone management, especially on the static zone. As far as I know, this, what you are seeing on the screen, is the first publication in the Spanish language of the Curry's technique. We call it the encofrado. It means like a coffin, like a coffin is a building term, because what we do when we do this technique is building kind of a coffin. And this was the publication with Dr. Gustavo Cabello and Dr. Carlos Lopez Niñoles. And as far as I know, it was the first time it was published in the Spanish language. This case was the first case I ever treated. Uh, this was mm, the case of the publication. And we can see a um, big bone defect where the cursor is now, big bone defect, 13 millimeters bone defect. And there was a lateral canine premolar missing. And we did the coughing with autogenous bone, autogenous bone blocks. And four months later, we did the re-entry. And we can see here in the lower row, the vital mature bleeding bone. We placed three implants, the canine and the two premolars. And the lateral, we didn't place it because it was going to be a cantilever, as we can see here. And here we can see the final result. It was in December of, two, of 2010. This case is now almost 10 years. And it's mm, a long-term success. I will share with you the rationale why, why, uh, why, mm, why I do this technique. I must say that I will not go deeper in the fundamentals on the basics because those will be explained by Dr. Sheriff Kuchu. I will only say that when I use this technique, I use 100% autogenous bone. I avoid biomaterials. And what I do is to take the bone and split the bone in order to obtain extra thin bone blocks, easy to revascularize, and they act as natural biological membranes. I use only autogenous bone because we all know that autogenous bone is the gold standard and it has the three, the three properties that we look for in any grafting material, I mean osteoinduction, osteogenesis and osteoconduction. So I will start by presenting cases, and in those cases, you will see my tips, my approach, the way I treat my patients. And I think you can obtain some ideas on, I will try to share with you the rationale why, why I do what I do. I have this case. This was a woman, 31 years old. She's a doctor, a medical doctor, and she had implants. She had a big infection, big bone loss, and she was referred to me to treat the right maxilla. When we see, the, when we saw the CBCT, we saw that there was a very large vertical defect. We saw the big bone loss, and in the apex of the lateral incisor, we saw a we can see here in the cursor, we see here a periapical lesion that communicated with the palatal aspect of the bone defect. 
Another problem was that the root canal treatment were, was done with uh, silver cone. So mm, the endodontic treatment could not be remade. So we had to do an apectomy of the lateral incisor and it was mandatory to treat the lateral incisor because, because it communicated with the defect on the palatal aspect. So what I do always is a suprachrestal incision. I know this approach is not too popular, but that's what I do. I do a suprachrestal incision and my rationale for my suprachrestal incision is that the palatal flap will be always vascularized by the palatal arteries and the buccal flap will be always vascularized, obviously, by the buccal arteries. So where both flaps meet, I do my incision. And I think that if I master the soft tissue management, I will have no exposure. We will speak, I think, in question and answer about that topic. So when we raise the flap, we see this big bone defect, a large bone defect, and also here in the right slide, in the right picture, we can see the communication in the apex of the lateral incisor. We can see the communication, buccal palatal communication here in the problem. So we see the defect and we had to do an apectomy. We cut the rod tip and we mm, prepare a cavity on the apex of the lateral incisor and we filled this cavity with MTA. Then we raise a flap in the mandible. This flap was made in order to harvest bone blocks. We harvest from the external oblique line of the left side of the mandible a big bone block. And then in the shin, a uh, lesser, a uh, lower, a uh, smaller bone block. And we split those blocks. So we place a big block in the buccal aspect and another big block in the palatal aspect. I always like to put the block in the palatal aspect because I want to seal very well, very, very hermetic the, the um, defect. And then after I place the buccal and the palatal blocks, I filled the, the, um, the coffin with autogenous bone, particulated autogenous bone. I also put the bone in the cavity we made in the root tip of the lateral incisor. And finally, I placed a coronal block. I always try to place my coronal block because I want to have a strong cortical block in the coronal part. This is a view of the final bone graft with the three blocks, buccal, palatal, and coronal. And then after releasing incisions on the periosteum, we obtain tension-free primary closure using mattress and interrupted sutures. This is the aspect four months later when we're gonna do the re-entry. And here we can see the incision. And this is the aspect of the bone when we raise the flap. We can see a vital bleeding mature bone. See the palatal cortical block, the buccal cortical block is totally vital bleeding. And we have no problem to place three implants, one in the canine, one in the second premolar, and the other in the first molar. The first premolar was gonna be a pontic. So we can see here the three implants. And we place a connective tissue graft that we harvest from the other side of the palate, and we left the implant and the CTG submerged. Here we can see the re-entry four months later. And four months later, this is the radiographic aspect. We can see the nice bone formation in the root tip. So I think the apectomy had been a success. 
and we can also see the implants in the right position. And now we go for the second surgical phase. We do a small incision, only enough to remove the cover screw and place transmucosal healing abutments. And then from the other side of the palate, we raise, uh, we obtain a uh, connective tissue graft. Remember, we have obtained another connective tissue graft from that very area four months before, but in four months, it's already healed, so we took another CTG. And then we prepare a recipient bleeding bed, mm, removing all the elastic fibers and the epithelium of the alveolar mucosa. And we suture that flap in the apical area. And we place the connective tissue graft with interrupted sutures in order to create a new keratinized tissue and reposition of the mucogingival line. We can see that this is not new. This is not new. This was discovered by Karin Lang Low, the founding fathers of the modern periodontal um, specialty, and some of them, and, and that CTG will have the power to create keratinized epithelium. So this is the healing. And here we can see the final result. We can see a nice canine. It's very symmetric to the other, and there are the other teeth. And remember the starting point and the final point. The starting point in the left and the final result in the right side. A complete three-dimensional bone regeneration. Now I want to share with you this second case, or third case, if we count the first. Uh, this third case is a case that is unfortunately more common every day in my practice. This was a patient, she had an implant, the implant had um, Perimplantitis, the implant started to lose bone, and the bone loss um, produced also periodontal loss in the adjacent teeth. So we will take a closer view. We see the lack of symmetry between both canines. And this is the aspect after removing the crown we see the implant with a big, big recession, a big bone loss. We see a severe recession in both the lateral and the premolar, and the lateral also have an endoperial lesion. The endoperial lesion, the lateral was hopeless. And due to the hypersensitivity, unfortunately also the first premolar was, was hopeless. So, first thing we did was extracting the implant, and then mm, the patient started an orthodontic treatment. So, we had to re extract the left premolar. We can see on the other side the extraction. And we tried to do a little orthodont orthodontic extrusion. It was done by my wife. I remember, I told you she was an orthodontist. And, but it was not possible due to the, to the endoperial lesion in the lateral incisor, in the gingival recession in the premolar. So both teeth, the lateral and the premolar, had to be extracted. And this is the aspect three months after the extraction. Let's take a closer look. We can see that the case is very, very inconvenient because we have not only a bone defect, but also a soft tissue defect. This keloid that you can see here was because when the patient had periplantitis, her dentist did a connective tissue graft. It was mm, not a good treatment. It got necrotized and we have this big bone defect. We can see the palatal rugets from the buccal view. So it's, a, in my opinion, a tough case. 
So what will be my approach? Same as the case before. I mean, I do a supracrestal incision where the palatal flap and the buccal flap meet. So I raise a flap and we can see in the second premolar, remember the first premolar was extracted, we can see in the second premolar a fenestration is meaningless. And in the alveolar ridge, we can see that it's very, very narrow, very narrow. So we need three dimensional bone regeneration. I mean, coronal, buccal, and palatal. We can see here that we have a seven millimeter mm, bone defect, a seven millimeter vertical component. And we're gonna harvest the bone. So we raise a flap in the left side of the mandible and we took a block from there. And we also went to the right side of the mandible and we took another block. Then we split the block. Sagittally, I will not speak about that because Dr. Kuchu will speak a lot about that. And then when we split the, bo the blocks, I place a block in the vocal aspect and I place another block in the palatal aspect. Then after I put both walls, I fill the gap with particulated bone, autogenous bone, everything. And you can see here some bone peaks. These bone peaks have, has to be smooth, has to be rounded. We cannot leave these bone peaks here because we may have a perforation of the flap during the healing period. So we need to round all these angles, all bone peaks. And then we place a final coronal block. So we have the three blocks, a big bone block in the vocal aspect, another big bone block in the palatal aspect, and the last block in the coronal aspect. And then we close the sutures and you can see here that we place every papilla in the right place. This is the final result. We can see here. This is the final result. And this is the aspect four months later. Four months later, the healing has been uneventfully Everything has gone fine. And now we're gonna do the re-entry. Question is, where will we place the implant? There's a meeting between the restorative dentist and the orthodontist, and they made a setup, an orthodontic setup, so they can decide where they will place the implant. And here we can see the homemade surgical guide which is supported by, I will go back, it's supported by the molar and the premolar because these teeth will not move anymore. These teeth will be moved, but the second premolar and the first molar will be mm, on that position so we can support the surgical guide on these two teeth. And then we raise a flap, a supracrestal incision, and this is what we got four months later. This is the regeneration that we can see. Uh, vital, bleeding, mature, I can say bright bone. A total mm, three-dimensional bone regeneration. We can see that there is no vertical component anymore. We can see the big vocal mm, bone wall that we have now and also the cortical block we can see complete completely integrated in the palatal aspect so this is the before and the after seven millimeters bone regeneration and here we can see the palatal and vocal bone regeneration complete three-dimensional bone regeneration in four months so now we're going to place the implant and when we drill the bone we use this hollow trephine. We harvested this biopsy. And we analyzed this biopsy. And it said that it's totally vital bone. 
with vessels, osteoblasts, osteocytes, etc. Vital bone. So we place on this case one only implant in the canine. It's a 4.2 millimeters implant, um, I think 13 millimeters long. We see the implant in here in the right position, in the right three-dimensional three position. And then we harvested a CPG from the other side of the palate. We fixed the graft like a saddle, and then we submerged both the implants and the flap, and, and, the, and the CTGs, excuse me. So here we can see three months later the aspect. The ridge is totally, totally, totally rebuilt. And now we're going for the second surgical phase. We see that, the, that with only a small incision, we managed to remove the cover screw and we placed a transmucosal healing abutment. And this is the temporary restoration. We can see that now actually the mm, implant supported canine crown is smaller, we can say, than the contralateral canine. We can see here, we see the radiopacity of the regenerated bone. And this is the final restoration. In the final restoration, we did an implant supported crown on the canine. The lateral incisor is a cantilever. And we also used composites. I don't. Dr. Carlos Lopez Niñoles, who is the restorative dentist of these cases, because I don't do restorative dentistry, uh, I only do surger um, surgery. So he did the composites on the other teeth and it's an implant supported by only one implant, mm, two, two crowns. So we can see now the symmetry with, between both canines. This is the final result. We see the symmetry, lateral views, lateral views. And remember, remember please the starting point. We see the lack of symmetry. The right canine looks like the father of the, of the normal, natural left canine. See the before. And see the final result. This is another view. Look at the bone, it's totally, totally integrated. And this is the final result. With symmetry, I asked the patient to reposition the mucogingival line, but she was tired, tired of surgery. She said she had suffered too much, so she didn't want any, any, any more surgery. So that's the final result. We can see the symmetry there. Now we will see another case. This is a very, very, very interesting case. This is a 23 years old man, non-smoker, and he had a big trauma on the left central incisor. We can see the fistula in here and in here. After the structure, we see the horizontal fracture. And right after the extraction, I realized that of course, there was no vocal bone wall, but also this patient didn't have palatal bone wall. And the most difficult thing was that the distal wall of the socket was lost. So from the socket, you could see perfectly the initial aspect of the root of the lateral incisor. So after cleaning and cleaning and cleaning, there was no bone to preserve, but I could put some collagen sponges inside. And this CTG, like a saddle. The objective of this CTG was keeping this level, avoid recession on the initial aspect of the lateral incisor. This is the aspect three months later. You may see here this resorption 
this patient told me that mm, when he was very young, he had an orthodontic treatment. So this, this mm, resorption was due to the orthodontic treatment many, many, many years before. And now this is the aspect that we're gonna treat with our regeneration. We are lucky because we managed to maintain here the soft tissue peak in here, although we have no bone. But at least we have some soft tissue. So we will raise a flap, a supracrestal incision, as I always do. And this is the aspect after raising the flap. This bleeding hide, this bleeding hides here about three millimeters of the defect because the bone defect was actually this level. We can see that this, this is a very, in my opinion, very, very difficult um, case because we have not only a bone defect, we have a periodontal dehiscence on the lateral incisor. Actually, I know that many people, many great surgeons usually extract this lateral incisor in order to have a bone picking here and a bone picking here. But I am a periodontist. I will try to keep this tooth, the lateral incisor, and I don't mind this. I will be very careful and I will try to regenerate this area, the mesial area of the root of the lateral incisor. So I go to the mandible, to the left side of the mandible, and I extract a block from the sternal oblique line. And then I cut the block, I split the block, and I put one big block on the vocal side, another big block in the palatal side. You can see the ceiling of the palatal aspect in here. And then I put another block, a small block, in here and another in the coronal aspect. So this is the final, the final blocks I place. This is the buccal block, the palatal block, and the coronal block. The coronal block is very, very, very strong, but I didn't want to touch the root of the lateral incisor. That's why using a ranger, I shaped this small triangle in here and trying, trying, trying until by friction I could fix this, I could fix this triangle. And you can see here the vocal bone level, the vocal level of the vocal block. So it will act as a tent pole when I put this particulated bone over the root. So now my question as a periodontist is, do I have to place a membrane if I want to cover the bone with the root with bone? I didn't do it. I didn't do it because even though I place a collagen membrane there is not predictable, but I also have the theory that, I will go back one slide, that this bone block will act as a tent pole and we will prevent the collapse of the flap over the root, acting like a, like a tent pole. But it was a hypothesis. So I didn't place any membrane. When I use Curry's technique, I try to be very purist and I don't use any collagen membrane, only the bone. And after releasing incisions on the periosteum, we managed to get tension-free primary closure using mattress sutures and interrupted sutures. Here we can see the aspect nine months later, healing was uneventful, but there's something that I don't like, and it's this. The scar I had here because of the first CTG I placed, but it's a price, it's a, it's a price I had to pay if I wanted to keep the soft tissue leveling here. So I have this car, but it's a price to pay. So now I will raise a flap. And after nine months, after raising a flap, I see this bone. 
I can see that this bone is bright, it's vital, it's bleeding, it's mature, it's very, very strong, and I see no resorption. I see no resorption on the, on the blocks, because you can see here the screw, the head of the screws is totally, totally at the bone level. And what is more, more, more satisfactory for me is seeing this. This is what satisfies me more, seeing this thick bone wall on the lateral incisor. So after removing the screws and seeing this big regeneration, now I will go for the implant, to place the implant. Another view. You can see vital bleeding bone, beautiful bone. Remember the before. Remember that we didn't have any bone in the mesial area of the lateral incisor and in the vocal area, and we see this complete regeneration. I can say, and I need to say, that this is not predictable. I hate when people say, this is what I see every day. This is not predictable. This is a good case, we can say that we provide, we provide the environment for this to happen, but um, we can also say that it's a merit of the patient. The patient is a strong boy and he had a good, um, a good um, capacity of healing. So we were able to place the implant. It's a four millimeters implant. We can see here the implant, surrounded totally by bone. And as always, I placed a CPG as a saddle. We see the CPG. And we cover everything um, after releasing the incisions. Three months later, we're going for the second surgical phase. We see the nice aspect of the mucosa. Second surgical phase, we managed to remove the cover screw and put this transmucosal healing abutment. We see the x-ray, implant totally surrounded by bone. And this is the crown the very day we placed it. In this patient didn't have a temporary crown. We went straight to the final crown. And this is the aspect seven years later. Seven years later, we see that we have a small papilla and we see this aspect. We see the lateral view. And this is the frontal view. You can believe me that I have said to this patient many times, let me place a CTG like an envelope, it will be a quick operation. And he always say, I'm very, very happy with the result. I don't need any more. I'm very happy. I smile fine. So this young patient now is 31 years old and he's very happy with the result. This is the aspect seven years later. But what is the best for me is seeing the maintenance of the bone. The maintenance of the bone is totally, totally healthy, strong, radiopath. And mm, one question is, is this, is this new attachment, new periodontal attachment, is an ankylosis? I really don't care. I see a nice result. The lateral incisor is fine. There's no resorption on the root. So for me, the result is fine. For the patient, more than perfect for him. I would like to place a new CTG, but he doesn't allow me to do it. So this is the long-term seven years result. Now we're going for the last case. This is a lady, 44 years old. She had, a, she had a big trauma on the left central incisor. Believe me, she used to have a normal bite. 
and we can see mm, that now she has an open bite. She had an implant, the implant had a big infection, a severe infection, and the infection made mm, bone loss not only on the implant, but also on the adjacent teeth. We can see the resorption. And now we will take a closer view. This is the, the CBCT where we can see that the implant is invading the incisor canal, is totally inclined. And after removing the Maryland that she had, we can see that it has not only a bone defect, but also a soft tissue defect, which makes the case even more difficult. But mm, we managed to introduce the implant retriever without raising a flap. And we managed to remove the implant in an automatic way. And this is the aspect three months after re implant removal. We can see the healing of the soft tissues. And now we're going for the surgery. We can see here that we have a big, big deficit of soft tissue. We see the recession and this is the CBCT and the periapical X-ray. On this blue line here, we see that we have no bone at all in the palatal aspect. This is the lateral view. And now we will see the CBCT. We can see here, we can see here the destruction, no palatal bone wall, but even though we have no bone in the palatal aspect, we will go for the same approach as always. So I mean, we do a suprapresta incision why? Because what I explained before, because I want the palatal aspect, the palatal flap totally vascularized and also the vocal flap. And after raising the flap, this is what we have. We have this very, very huge bone defect, no palatal bone wall at all. And remember that's communicating with the incisor canal. We can see in the yellow arrows, and here we can see that the roots of the adjacent teeth had periodontal dehiscences. So in my opinion, it's a very, very tough case, not only because of the bone defect, because of the lack of palatal wall, but also because of the periodontal dehiscences. This is the communication with the incisor canal and this is the lack of the buccal bone wall. So now we go to the left side of the mandible and we harvest this large bone block. Here we can see a comparison between the incisor, the central incisor, and the size of the block. It's a large block. We remove this bone marrow with a ranger and after splitting the block, we put a big block in the vocal aspect and another big block on the palatal aspect with individual um, screws. So I don't like to, to, to unite the vocal and the, the palatal blocks with the same screw because I don't feel um, sure about the stability of the, of the palatal block if I do that. I feel more comfortable doing separately two screws for the vocal block and another screw completely independent in the palatal block. And then after fixing very strong, very stiff the blocks, I filled all the gap with autogenous bone, particulated autogenous bone. And then I placed the final block, a very, very thin 
almost, we can say, transparent coronal block. It's very thin. I like that, that block mm, to be very thin because I want that block to be easy to revascularize. So I, mm, in my opinion, if I do it very, very thin, it will vascularize mm, even quicker and I will diminish the risk of dehiscence and here you can see in the in this left picture the frontal view and here the incisal view the palatal block the coronal block and the vocal block and here we also put some more particulated bone so after releasing periosteum incision we managed to obtain tension free primary closure by using matrix sutures and um, interrupted sutures. And I'm not afraid of wood diseases. I'm not afraid because I'm a periodontologist and I have to manage, I have to manage, I have to master, I have to master the soft tissue management so I don't have exposure of the bone blocks. This is another view of the, of the of the suture, you can see every papilla in the right place. Every papilla in the right place. That is very important for me. Donor area, and this is the aspect six months later. Six months later, we see the aspect. We have moved the mucogingival line, of course, but it doesn't matter by this time. We take a CBCT we see this radiopacity, the bone is totally radiopath. We can see here the vocal block, the coronal block, and the palatal block. And now we will see the CBCT. In the CBCT, what I like to see better is the palatal block here. The palatal block, you can see it here. It's sealing totally, totally the palatal aspect of the bone defect. So we have a perfect coughing in there. So now we're gonna place the implant. Placing the implant will be a very, very easy task because now we have a lot of vital, bleeding, mature, bright bone. Here we can see the bone is bleeding, is vital, is mature. The level, the bone level is in my opinion, optimal. Many views of the bone. The incisal view. And this is after removing the screws, we see the stability. Remember, I left it for six months. I don't like very much the, 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 the four months when I try to, 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 to we can say, regenerate um, some alveolar dehiscence on the, on the adjacent teeth. I leave um, a longer healing period of six months. Then I placed the implant, frontal view, incisal view and then I go to the palatal I go to the palate and I get this big CTG I use this big CTG because I want to improve the biotype I want to have a better emergence profile I leave it all submerged and we can see here that the lip is always in is almost in contact with the with the crowns. Three months later, this is the aspect. I have a lot of soft tissue in here. We can see the radio opacity of the regenerated bone in here. And we do a second surgical phase. And this is the temporary crown. Now we have a problem. We have a soft tissue problem because we have no keratinized tissue at all in here. So I need to reposition the mucogingival line. I prepare our bleeding recipient bed. 
by making a, a split thickness flap. I remove all the elastic fibers and I place a CTG from the pallet and I fix the CTG with interrupted sutures very easily. And this is the aspect three months later. Three months later, remember, this central incisor is rotated, this lateral incisor is also kind of rotated, and this is extruded. So it will be an easy, an easy orthodontic treatment. All we want is some alignment of these teeth. Mm, this is the orthodontic treatment that my wife, Gemma, did in here. And this is after some months of treatment. Now we change to a second temporary crown. Of course, we needed here some help using composite. It's obvious, but we can see here that we have now a good vestibule. We see here the radio opacity of the new bone. And now we're going, we're going to the final crown. We can see here the emergence profile the horse shoe shape of the maxilla. And this is the final crown. The final crown that was made by Dr. Rafael Navarro. Uh, here we can see that he mm, made some composite in this tooth, on this tooth, and this is uh, an implant supported crown. This is the final result. This is a lateral view. I like better the emergence profile of the crown, of the implant supported crown than that of the natural crown. This is a frontal view and an incisal view. We see the screw in here. We didn't invade the palate area and we didn't invade the incisal edge. So the implant is in the optimal three-dimensional position. We see the before, remember the recession, that we had no bone in here, and the final result. The before and the after. All this tissue is regenerated, is new. Before and after, another view. Remember the bone defect, and see the radio opacity of the new generated bone. This is a panoramic X-ray. And I want you to keep this in mind. We can obtain this by doing the split bone block technique, mm, doing this protocol I, uh, that was invented by Professor Curry. This is the final result. Uh, an implant in perfect position with beautiful bone, radiopac, and this nice, this nice mm, soft tissue contour. And of course, we also needed some help with composite in the adjacent teeth. All these techniques are described in my book. It's from Editorial Quintessence. It's in Spanish. Hopefully someday it will be in English. And I will say my conclusions. Um, my conclusion, which I recognize are personal. Are personal because I know a lot of people uses another, another approaches, but I will read my, my conclusions. I always do suprachrestal incisions, um, keep in mind the anatomy. My palatal flap is always vascularized and my vocal flap is always vascularized. I use releasing vertical incisions always, only that I do it off the aesthetic zone, the, the vertical incisions. Careful raising of the flap, full thickness, avoid ripping it. Total debridement of the bone surface, cover the particulated graft as much as possible, releasing periosteum incisions, and tension-free primary closure. Filling material when we do the 
split bone block technique or Curry's technique is and should be autogenous bone 100%. The healing period, usually four months is enough. If I have to regenerate the adjacent bone in the, the adjacent teeth bone, I mm, let it heal a little longer. We can say six months or even in the lateral case, we leave it for nine months. And something very, very important is this last sentence, accept limitations. These kind of cases cannot mm, finish perfect. We need to accept some composite, some limitations. So I want to thank all of you for attending this presentation. Uh, you can see here my website www.orthopedio.net or drdavidgonzalez.com. You can reach me there and I'm very grateful to you for being there and I'm, be, I'm very grateful to Dr. Cherry Fuchut for the invitation. And now I will try to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. I think this was an amazing concept in the aesthetic zone from you presented to our community of uh, biological bone uh, masters here on our first online uh, congress. Thank you. I, I am reading here, I am reading many questions, many things from all of the world. And I will start with the question. I think you can see the question, David. Yes, I can see it. Look, when you click here on left from the admin, you can see 16. I collect 16 questions. Click on 16. Can you see it? 16, 16, 16. Yes, 16, yes. In what side? Uh, no, here. Look, uh, pop that is public, all, and then is questions. Yes, higher, more higher, more higher. Public. Right side, right side is at the chat, then right side, right? More not more to right. Public um, chat, poll, handout, public, all 16. And questions, 16 here. questions. I press here in the 16. Correct, correct. Press there. Okay. And then you can see all the questions and then you can start with oh, one okay okay i go out and you can have to uh, do you have okay, okay. now 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 sherry i can see i can see the 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 i can see the question can i start answering yes of course okay uh bilal or margie ask me there might be soft tissue in vagination since we don't we do not use a membrane which will lead to bone resorption I know what you mean, and that's why I that's why I try to to cover the particulated bone as much as possible. I think uh, a small amount of bone without covering is no problem. It's no problem, but um, that's why my recommendation was to cover as much as possible the particulated bone. Uh, I will keep reading what the length of the screw of the coronal block in the last case and uh, where was it screwed considering the large apical defect. Oh, that's a very, very good question. A question that I always, that I'm always asked is the longest that I have is 14, 14 mm, millimeters and I managed to place it mm, close to the apex of the central incisor but actually mm, it's not totally under my control is is i could say it's merit of my nurse mm, because i can drill and without separating my eyes from the from the drilling point mm, i extend my hand and she put me the, the screwdriver on my hand and, and, and i follow the direction so it doesn't happen the first time you do it mm, always but mm, Mm, we managed to, to, to place it, but answering your question is 14, 14 millimeters. I will keep reading. 
If you make holes in the occlusal or vocal plate, will the angiogenesis bone augmented? I don't think it's necessary to make holes in the in the in the plate. I, I don't think it's necessary. Mm, I don't do it. I don't do it. Question: Which bone screw system do you recommend? Mm, whatever you have. I don't want to say any brand in here. Mm, maybe Dr. Sheriff could you want to say any anything about that? I don't want to speak about any brand. How many torques do you get after four months healing of autogenous bone regeneration while implant insertion? Is there any difference between muscular and bone? I will tell you something. I try not to obtain a high torque. I usually, when I'm drilling on regenerated bone, I use a, a new set, a new kit of, of burst. I don't like to, to, to stress the regenerated bone. I, mm, mm, I am lucky because I'm lucky because the, the, my company provides me of new births every time I have to, to, to place an implant on regenerated bone. So, so, so I don't look for a high torque. I usually place my implant at 25 or, or 20 or even 30 but I don't like more, more than 30 mm, newtons. I will keep reading. Did you do something, the surface of the lateral root before putting the bone chips? That's a beautiful question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's a question by Dr. Hakan Akman. Beautiful question. I didn't do nothing. If I had to do that case now, I would play some M domain. But by that time, remember that case was done eight years before. I, I have to say that I have been using M domain since 1998 in, when I was doing my program in the University Complutense of Madrid. So I'm an, I could say that I'm a very old user of endogame, but my hypothesis one I wanted to 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 to, to prove if, if it was the technique or if it was the endogame. That's why I didn't do it. I think it's the technique what works. But nowadays. I always do endogame because now I'm sure that this technique has the potential to grow bone over the roots. Not always, but it has a good potential. It's, as I say, it's not totally predictable. But now I usually mm, apply some endogame on the, on the roots. So my advice is if you want to use endogame, go ahead. Dr. Didier has thickness of bone block used. I think the I think the thinner the better. Sometimes I don't do it mm, too thin because I maybe this operation is to be done mm, by a team. I don't have a team. I do it all myself. I extract the bone myself. I split the bone myself. So maybe I don't have enough time to 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 scrap the bone and make it thinner. So, so that's why sometimes you saw the block not too thin, but I think the thinner, the better. Do you cover the donor side with something after you take a buccal block? I didn't, I didn't speak about that because I understand Dr. Sherry Kuchuk, we speak about that, but I, do what I learned in the two weekends I went to Osberg is placing some collagen sponge in there. So that's what I do. I will keep reading. Ah, it's a nice question of Dr. Darius Pranaja. Yeah. Dr. Darius asked me, you got a big, fat, thick, and delicate bone, but why you placed only one implant instead of two implants? I think you are speaking about the implant I removed in the K9. Mm, 
Because if you place two implant, you don't have enough papilla. You have only 3.5 papilla mm, between two implants. If you place, if you place one implant and one pontic a cantilever, you will have 5.5. So mm, I wanted to have a little more papilla, and I think a big implant like the one I placed. It was a 4.2 mm, millimeters diameter and 13 millimeter length implant. I didn't need two implants for that. The lateral can be a cantilever with no problems. If I have to place two central incisors, I place two implants. But when I place the central incisor and the lateral is a cantilever, or as in this case, when I place a canine and the lateral will be a cantilever, I place only one implant. The lateral is always a cantilever. I will keep reading, Ricardo, why not two implants and no cantilever? I already explained because I wanted to have some papilla. Is the coronal block mandatory? That's a very tough question by Dr. Asma Dishlani. That's a very tough question. And I think it's very controversial. In my practice, I can speak of what I say. In my practice, it's mandatory. But I see many, many, many big surgeons who doesn't, big surgeons who don't do that. But um, I do it. In my practice, it's mandatory. It's all I can tell you. I like better the, the, the coronal bone when I put the, when I put the, the, the coronal block. So in my practice, it's mandatory. In other people's practice, Mm, it's up to them, so I can tell you what I do. In your first case, did you not cover, you need to cover the flat UCTG at the face of the kneecap, why? In your first case, did you not cover the flat UCTG? Ah, um, this is a good question. It's difficult to, to, to read because of the reduction the reduction, but I will say, um, someone asked me that when I was repositioning the mucogingival line, why did I not cover the CTG? Um, because it's a free CTG. Um, it has the power to, to, to produce keratinized tissue. So, so um, it would have been kind of a nonsense to cover the CTG. The CTG was not meant um, for, for increasing the volume of soft tissue. The, the CTG was to create a new keratinized tissue and um, above all things to reposition the mucogingival line. That's why I didn't cover it. Because if I cover um, against um, what I try to do. So you do a, a bleeding recipient bed you remove all the elastic fibers and then you put your CTG and you will create a nice band of keratinized tissue. I will keep reading. Can a curry technique fail if the flap or bone block being exposed? How to manage the bone plate being exposed for a few days? Of course it can fail. Of course it can fail. If it is exposed, it can fail. So you have to be very careful, very secure. You have to run every bone peak. You cannot leave a bone peak because you will have a perforation. You will need to close mm, tension-free primary closure. You need to avoid the, the, the exposure because if you have exposure, if you have exposure, you have to, 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 to grind the, the exposure, the, the exposed part. So, so you, mm, you need to, to avoid exposures. What is your pre and post medication? My pre medication, my pre medication is, is mm, antibiotics one hour before and seven days later. And steroids and anti inflammatory, ibuprofen 600. Another question, it's not difficult to guess that it's much better, but just want to know if I can proceed into 
alternatives to this technique, mm, in my opinion, for these big, big cases, the only alternative possible is GBR using non-resorbable titanium reinforced mm, PTFE membrane, an autogenous bone or a mix. In my opinion, and everybody is free to, to have an opinion, in my opinion, the only alternative is, is a PTFE membrane. It's what has mm, literature scientific support. Very, very much, a lot of mm, scientific mm, support. Another question, the last question I can see here is, what's the difference of success between autogenous bone block comparing with the alloplastic blocks? Can you mention about it, please? I can answer that question. I can't because I have never, ever used in my life alloplastic block. So I cannot make a comparison. Maybe Dr. Sheriff can speak about that. When I, when I, when I do Curry's technique, I'm a purist and I know that day I have to work a lot and I only use um, autogenous block 100%. So it's beyond my knowledge that answer. So Sherry, I think all the, all the questions have been answered. I think, I think no, we have, no, we have more. Uh, colleagues all over the world uh, have to stay David, more time here to give more answer. I, I collect 10 answers in Domio. Uh, check it, David. Please check it. I collect Let me see. No, Let 28 me. questions. But we have a question from the social media. You can search and I will send the question to you. From the next question is from one minute. Where is the question? So, uh, Matev Sunny, how to stabilize coronal block? I I I I I I said before. I said before. Okay. Mm, it's a long, a long 40 millimeters, a long uh, 40 millimeters uh, 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 screw. screw. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, okay, Rutali Kama is. His her uh, question is: Can we do the grafting immediately post? Extraction. Not in my hands. I I, I let it heal. Uh, you you mean to do, do a, a, a split bone block immediate immediate post extraction? I think yes. In my during the extraction. Not not in my hands. Not in my hands. Maybe somebody else can, but I, I I'm, I'm not able. One uh, one indication, but is. Uh, it's with implants. If you have implants and you have to explant, uh, we uh, it's not infection, it's a bone absorption, something or bone uh, implant break. Then you, you we prefer to uh, explantation and uh, make a reconstruction together. In some case, it's possible, but it is not the concept. No? Maybe fractured implants. Mm, I don't understand the question, Sheriff. Sorry. Uh, the question was: uh, uh, the question is here. Can we do the grafting immediately post extract extraction? Post implant extraction. Immediate? No. Um, post extraction, the grafting procedure, uh, Kuri. What you you meaning is no. You are waiting conventional minimum six weeks, eight weeks to uh, to one closer. It's correct. Yes. Okay. Uh, the answer is no, not immediately. Yes, I, 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 let it, I, I, I prefer a healing period. Yes. The next question, Azita Kandampur, did you use Emdugin? You answer the question. Nowadays, I'm using it. But mm, mm, before, in the first cases I did, I didn't use it. You, you need to know, if you see all these cases have the final prosthesis, so these cases, I like to present when I present uh, in my conferences, I like to present cases with the final prosthesis. You know it takes long to, to, to get to the final prosthesis. So these cases were operated some years ago, but nowadays I'm using Mdogain. As I told you, I'm a periodontologist. 
I've been using endogain for more than 20 years. And, and, and for periodontics, it's a very, very common tool for me. But for, for implants, on this case, I've been using maybe for the last three years because I wanted to, 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 to know if, if it was only the technique that provided the regeneration. And actually, speaking strictly from a periodontology point of view, you can never speak about regeneration if you don't use endogain. You can say bone growth or something because you need some histology to speak of regeneration. But now that I know that I can create bone on the roots, now I, I always put some endogain and then the particulated bone. No, thank you very much, David. Normally normal we are over the time, uh, five minutes. So I have a question to the audience. I have many questions from the Facebook live. Okay. Uh, it's okay that we send no the question to Professor David Gonzalez and then I start. What is your meaning? I have many questions from Facebook here, I think 10, 15. For me, it's okay. It's your it's your your congress. When you want to bring the question to end live in live session, we can make because I am the last speaker, and uh, I am. For me, no problem. Please send me the answer. Where is what is used? Okay, here's more questions. Okay, David, you are. It's okay for you. Yes, you want me to keep keep, keep to keep answering questions. Yes, I have many questions here. Okay, go ahead. Wow, wonderful. So, um, Gudin Shayman Sari from Turkey is asking, why did you use free CTG instead of free gingival graft? Because free gingival graft, I think in the upper part, remember we are speaking about the, the aesthetic zone. I, uh, 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 if I use uh, free gingival graft, I will have a keloid. Uh, uh, a scar tissue, a very, very um, unsightly um, anesthetic tissue because it's too keloid, too white, let's call, um, too keratinized. I prefer, I prefer connective tissue graft, free connective tissue graft because that way I will have a more mimetic tissue, a more mimetic result with the surrounding natural gingiva of the adjacent teeth. That's the reason why in the upper aesthetic zone I don't use I don't use free gingival graft. Actually, for me, it's a mistake. Thank you, David. Thank you for the question. The next one is: What is the diameter of the fixation pin? Diameter of what? Fixation pin. I think the screws. Oh? One millimeter. One millimeter. Okay. Yes. We are we are going very fast through the questions. Last. Case was amazing, Professor. Thank you for sharing. Okay, this was not a question. Uh, Murat Inji from Turkey. Thanks, Dr. Gonzalez. Great, great presentation. Okay, the next one. So, what was the diff, death of the implant in the graft? You mean if I place the implant in front body? Is that the question? Yes. Uh, I try. I try not to not to not to plan my 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 implant um, regarding the um, the bone level, but the but the crown level. I mean, four millimeters, four millimeters um, more apical than the, the than the gingival margin of the um, crown of the crown. That's that's my my goal. Usually, it is one millimeter deeper in the bone, but it's not, it's, it's not something that sometimes is totally totally at the bone level. Uh, I don't feel afraid about resorption, but usually one millimeter deeper, we may say. It also depends from implant system. Yes. Yes. Perfect. Thank you for the answer. David, the next question, Sabiha Khan. Thank you for the question. Asking what distance should be the bone plate edge be from the defect in Curie technique? 
I don't understand the question. Please repeat again. What what distance should be the bone plate edge from the from the defect, the X edge? The corner of the bone block, how how many millimeters in distance to the defect or close to the de defect or in contact from the bone blocks? Mm, I don't understand if you're speaking about how how close to the roots to the to the neighbor roots or, or the block from the block. The question is the block. How is the distance uh, should be the distance from the bone block X X as the, the corners? God, I don't understand the question. I, I understand. I think the the maybe, bone maybe block. You can answer for me because I don't understand. Yeah, I, I tried the bone. Uh, with contact with the defect, the edge, it's in contact yeah. or can be in uh, distance. And the, I think uh, the answer is when it's possible, you bring your bone corners to the neighbor defect anatomy to bring the contour in normal and in correct uh, nature anatomy. Um, when it's in the near the tooth, you know, David, no contact to the tooth. This is very important. That's rule. very important. Yes. You are a periodontologist, you are, you are more experienced. Yes. And but never it's contact. It's very important not to touch the roots. You can yes. be close for maybe half a millimeter, but yes. not touching. And yet, and, and why? The, the, we, we know why. Some Somebody maybe don't know why we don't have to bring the bone block to the Tooth? Why? Because you may have a, you may have a, 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 um, an infection. You you are interfering with the. With, with, in, in the case where that we managed to regenerate the lateral, I was yes. very very accurate, very accurate not to touch the root. I wanted yes. I wanted to be half a millimeter, which is almost nothing, but almost nothing for my eye. For the cells is a big highway to so and for the bleeding so for my eye it's, it's, it's a small gap but for the for the vessels for the blood vessels it's a highway so so we cannot touch the root we cannot be in contact with the root we can be very close but not touching the root we need no blood supply in there if yes, you do that and you go to 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 risky you will have an infection Correct. This is the reason uh, why we do, why we don't prefer prefer this. The next question. Thank you for the question. So Sabia Khan was it? So okay. For anterior soft tissue graph, from the question is coming from Ashish Kaushal. Thank you. In uh, the uh, the anterior soft tissue graph in the aesthetic ratio. You prefer CD, CTG and posterior region, you prefer FGG, right? No, 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 no. I always use CTG in the upper and in the lower, I prefer the FGG. I mean, if I'm on the aesthetic zone or if I'm in the upper area, I go for the CTG in the upper. In the lower, in the lower, when I place in implants in the mandible mm, i prefer mm, free gingival graft with epithelium because i want to have a keloid a strong a very strong keratinized mucosa but in the upper mm, i settle with with tpg wonderful wonderful i think the answer is enough next question thank you nizami dentist how do you measure what thickness must have the new bone? And where do you take so much particulate bone? This is the magic of Curie technique. Please, your stage. Yes, I, I always go for the, uh, when I do this, I always go for the biggest result. Um, so I take a big block and if um, there's something I don't use, I prefer to, 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 to to throw away some bone instead of being short. So, so that's why. 
Okay, and, and how thin? How do you create your thin blocks? This equation. How do you know it? How thin? How thin? As I said before, the thinner the better for me. If if in some surgeries you didn't see the the block mm, so thin, it's because yeah. I didn't have I didn't have much time to 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 scrub the bone and, and, and make it thinner. Okay. Now the next question. Do, uh, from Lydia Tremeloda, thank you for the question from Facebook Live for uh, Biological Bone Masters Group. What did you use, Microsoft or Piezo tool? Mm, both of them. I have both, and and um, it depends. It doesn't matter to me. I have both. I have the Microsoft and I have the Piezo surgery. Whatever you have is good. Okay, I say also in this uh, moment, if you have also the piezo tone, uh, in the first operation, I think you don't need to invest in a new uh, instrument. But uh, when you make more with the benefits of the microsaw, then I think it's better to have the microsaw. Hmm. That's right, David? It's, uh, I think both, both of them work. Yes. You can use uh, the Microsoft for uh, bone lead bone technique or to create the bone here for the implantation to give the new high yes. or to, yes, many indications. I, I love it. Okay, my next question from me to you, David. Oh, that's a tough, that's a tough one. I, I'm, I'm shaking, I'm shaking. No, no, you don't need it because, because <laughs> this, I try, I try for the audience and I start with you because uh, we have a, a little bit uh, experience, not history together, but I was in the same town, like where are you at the moment? Is right? Yes, yes. I was, for, I was a student of dentistry in, um, in, Col in the University of Cologne. I and remember, I, I remember, excuse me, I remember when I knew you, when I met you in, in Oldsberg, you were a resident, you, you you were having a, a, a baby by that time, uh, maybe you remember, a baby I remember, uh, yes. you were a student, a student in, in, in Oldsberg, yes, yes. <laughs> uh -huh. but he, he, was, he, he was a baby by that time. Uh, yeah, 2009 or something like that. And, 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 and if it was baby, then it was ten. Oh yes. And 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 um, I remember you told me you have lived one month in Murcia, and I was surprised that you could speak Spanish. It was a very big surprise. Someone in in Germany speaking Spanish. So yes. Mm -hmm. You know my Spanish is fatal. You won't make a compliment. It's a fine, muchas, muchas gracias. It's a fine Spanish. And uh, Murcia, uh, por los amigos de España, mi uh, España es real, real, uh, muy, muy mal. Pero uh, aprender español en la escuela para tres años y después seis años nada. Ante un momento cuando un profesora ¿Cómo se llama? Profesor, from the, uh, profesor de la Universidad de la Arezaca en Murcia. Es una Sebastián, Sebastián Méndez Trujillo. Sebastián Méndez Trujillo. Eh, eh, he estado en Alemania en un en, 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 en curso con el profesor Zöller sobre distracciones austro-guineses. Y en este tiempo, este dos o tres días, he oído. Como habla some, uh, algunos español, en este momento yo voy a aprender uh, 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 hablar español con uh, los uh, españolas, tres o cuatro colegas de España, de Murcia. Y cuando he empezado a hablar español, la profesora me ha dicho que no, no necesito, yo puedo hablar alemán. Yes, he, he, he speaks very, very perfect German. Yes, the professor from the um, University of Arisaka was six, six or eight years in, in Germany. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Imperio? Imperio? Oh, Imperio, I think. 
Nee, Maxle Facial Surgeon. Maxle yes, Facial Surgeon. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and then he 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 invite, during the like, during the lecture speech he invited me to come to Murcia. Yes. And he, he told me you can you don't need a flat. I have a I have a connection with a nurses clinic. You can stay with the nurses. Yes. Oh, I think a very nice kind of invitation. And not in this, this year, and one year later, I was in uh, Murcia for four weeks. It was a wonderful time. Uh, only four weeks, but I have many good friends in the clinic, outside. Uh, I learned Spanish. And, uh, and then told me, uh, David is from Murcia, and then all, uh, everything comes together. It's a, so, it's, a, it's a really short, it's a really small world. Yes, but I don't tell you my question. Okay, ask your question. Yeah. What would you, I, I will try to bring out from you three secrets. What is your success? And one to, first question is, I think the audience won't hear that. What would you do different when you know at the moment, before you start with the autogenous board, what, what would you do different? Oh, I want to tell you something. Uh, as I said before, I studied in the 90s in the University Complutense. I am a periodontologist. I was there for three years. And, yes. and, and as, a as a periodontist, I started doing membranes. Okay. And I was very, very happy about GBR with PTFE membranes. And I also had, by those times, I also did many times the Michael Picos technique. I mean, onlays, onlays of um, mandibular, cortical, medullar um, bone blocks. And um, that is good, that approach is good for horizontal, but not for vertical. And I remember in the EAO in Munich in 2005, that's when I saw for the first time um, Professor Kuris, and um, I was shocked about his presentation because he didn't use any membrane, but he obtained big, big, big amounts of bone. And actually, I didn't believe it the first time I saw it because in my periodontist mind, you couldn't do that if you didn't use a membrane. But when I saw him again in the osteology, I don't remember in which city of Europe I understood the concept. And that's when I asked him to go to Augsburg. And he told me, you can go to Augsburg. I have some courses. I remember I was the only one from Spain. That's why when I presented the publication, it was the first publication, as far as I know, in the Spanish language. And what it has changed for me is that it's fast um, because it's only four months with membrane. You have to wait one year. In my opinion, both techniques are kind of the same. You get in both techniques nice bone, beautiful results, but one is quicker. The other one is, is, is longer healing period. I'm very happy to use that technique. Next question, by both technique you mean is the same. What is with the risk groups? Okay. Small one, diabetics, it's the same or is the successful rate? Uh, again? No, I don't, do, I don't do this kind of surgeries in smokers nor in diabetic people. So I don't have experience with it. Maybe, maybe, maybe I'm too conservative. I, yes. I admit, but um, I don't trust in those in those patients. In those patients, I, if I have a patient with diabetes or a smoker, etc., I go for an easier technique, something like collagen membrane. Even though I don't get um, that better result, that beautiful result, but uh, I, I don't take any chance. I don't. I cannot tell you my experience in 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 compromised patients because I don't have it. I'm very, very conservative. Okay, okay. And you, I think you won't recommend colleagues uh, to start 
not with uh, comprehensive, uh, comprehensive or risk groups. Start with uh, no risk groups, or? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, uh, my recommendation, first thing I want to do is seeing your presentation, learning a lot from you, and, and, and I think I think whatever recommendation you you give, I will follow. Uh, but um, I, I recommend to start with easy cases, easy cases, even though someone may think it's an over treatment. An over treatment is a it's it's something wrong in a in a experienced surgeon. But if it's a if it's a young dentist who is learning, it's, I think you can start with an easy case. And then you go mm, deeper and harder, but for starting, an easy case. Okay, thank you for the recommendation. I make the uh, last question from the social media. Um, so, Matev Sani is asking you, is there any need for perforation the maxilla in this technique. You repeat, please. Perforation, perforation for the augmentation in uh, in maxilla. If I if I do if I do perforations in the in yes. cortical, I, yes. not necessary. Not necessary. There's a there's a there's a study by Stuart Neiman from Gothenburg mm -hmm. in the Calveria rabbit, and it's totally shown. Is 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 demonstrated in the scientific literature that you don't need perforations. Thank you so much, David, for your great presentation, Thank for you. your great uh, content. You.